Welcome to my show, Back to Basics, where I explore the human spine and attempt to make the complex simple. Hi there, I'm Joel Proskovitz, and welcome to my show, Back to Basics. I'm extremely excited to have you join me on this journey where I explore the wonderfully complex world of the lumbar spine and bring it to you, the viewer, in its most simple form. Please note that the content of this show is non-prescriptive. It is purely for information and entertainment purposes only. If you are currently dealing with low back pain, I urge you to seek out the guidance of a professional who is able to assist you. In this episode, I'm going to be speaking about spondylolisthesis. Now that's a really big name and a lot of people have been diagnosed with it, uh, either from their x-rays or their MRI scans, and they don't quite know what spondylolisthesis is, they don't know how they got it, and also they don't quite know what the implication of having it is for the future of their back health. So join me as we explore this really interesting world of spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis, if we break down the word, there are two words that make it up. The first is spondylo, which means spine or vertebra. And the second word is lysthesis, which means slippage. So essentially, a spondylolisthesis means that your vertebra has slipped forward above the vertebra below. So using this model, I'm going to show you here the L5 and the S1, and a spondylolisthesis is where the spine actually slips forward over the sacrum, and you have this deformity at the very lowest level. Now, for most spondylolisthesis, they occur at the very lowest level, which is L5 and S1, but they can occur higher up in the spine. In fact, they can even occur in the neck as well. There is a classification system for spondylolisthesis, and it demonstrates that there are five different types. Today, we're going to focus on type two, which is ismic spondylolisthesis. Now, the word ismic is derived from the word isthmus, which means, in anatomical terms, a narrow anatomical passage or part that connects two larger structures. Now the reason I'm using the word isthmus or ismic is because it relates to a particular portion of a bone at the back of the spine called the pars interarticularis. And right here you'll see just where I put my fingers, you will see that those are the pars bones or the pars interarticularis bones on either side, on the left and on the right. Now, what we've done is we've actually fractured them so there's a defect in both of the pars so that when I bend the spine forward, you'll actually see that the fracture line increases. Now, an ismic spondylolisthesis means that those bones have actually fractured and they've lost their ability to hold the spine in place. Therefore, the spine slips forward. Spondylolisthesis is usually an acquired spinal deformity starting in the childhood and adolescent years of life. It occurs mostly in an active and sporting population, particularly uh, the kids who involve themselves in gymnastics and martial arts and cricket fast bowling. And that's due to the repetitiveness of taking the spine through its full range of motion, both in flexion and in extension. And over time, that causes quite significant stress on the pars bones at the back of the spine. And the pars being thin and not having a great blood supply tend to fracture over time. And that fracture leads to something called a spondylolysis. That's where the pars fractures, but the spine itself doesn't actually slip forward. Now, if that goes undiagnosed and there's a continuation of 
uh, further uh, provocation of the spine, the spine can then progress to a spondylolisthesis and that's where the spine actually slips forward and now the pars have lost their ability to stop the spine from moving forward. The slippage of a spondylolisthesis is graded on a scale from 1 to 4 and we base it on how far the vertebra slips forward on top of the one underneath it and we take into account the total surface area. Now a grade 1 indicates that the slippage is between 0 and 25 percent, a grade 2 from 25 to 50, a grade 3 from 50 to 75 and a grade 4 from 75 to 100 percent slippage. The most common presentation, especially in the adult population, is a grade 1 or a grade 2 slippage. Grade 3 and grade 4 are far more rare um, in the general population. Now, a question that I get asked all the time is, if I have a grade 1 or a grade 2 spondylolisthesis, what is the uh, possibility that the spine would slip and progress to a grade 3 or grade 4? Now, in the mature skeletal population, so the adult population, the likelihood of a grade 1 or a grade 2 progressing to a grade 3 or 4 is very, very low. There would have to be a significant trauma to the spine, such as a road traffic accident, to actually create that further progression. So, it's highly unlikely that in daily life or just with normal training, that that is going to progress. Now, in a immature skeletal population, such as children or adolescents, they have a greater chance of that slip progressing, but it most likely would progress from a grade one to a grade two. Many people that have been diagnosed with a spondylolisthesis had no idea they had one until they got scans, either an x-ray or an MRI, and it came up as an incidental finding. Now, the interesting thing is, having a spondylolisthesis doesn't automatically mean that it's going to be a pain generator in your low back. In fact, I've seen many patients where they have a spondylolisthesis, but the pain is coming from a segment higher up in the spine and not from the spondylolisthesis itself. However, for people that do have a symptomatic spondylolisthesis, it can cause one of two or even both types of symptoms, and that is localized back pain, so directly in the area of where the spondylolisthesis is, or even offset slightly to the left or right, but it can also cause radicular pain going down the legs. That's the neural sciatic type pain. And it can go from the buttocks all the way down the legs. Many people have been told that if they have spondylolisthesis, that they need to avoid the movement of spinal extension. In other words, arching backwards. And one of the reasons for that is because the pars at the back of the spine will generally get provoked on extension, but also you've got joints above and below the pars called the facet joints and they can get provoked as well. The interesting thing is this, is every person that has a spondylolisthesis presents differently. Some people can actually handle extension and it doesn't increase their pain at all. Other people can't tolerate extension, but they can handle flexion and the reverse is also true. So, before any advice is given, especially if you've got a spondylolisthesis, it's very important for the patient to have a proper mechanical assessment to determine exactly what is causing their pain. The most definitive way of having a diagnosis of ismic spondylolisthesis is with the use of scans either x-ray or MRI or even CT. With an x-ray, they would film you from the side, possibly even slightly at an angle, so that they can capture 
the pause in a very uh, precise manner. They could even go further with x-rays by getting you to do a dynamic x-ray, which is where they would ask you to bend forward and then arch all the way back. And they would see if there's any translation of the L5 over the S1. And if there is a translation, they would measure that. And if it was four millimeters and more, they would classify that as an unstable spondylolisthesis. But if it was under four millimeters, they would classify that as stable spondylolisthesis. Now, if you want to mitigate the effects of radiation, an MRI is uh, an option. Unfortunately, an MRI doesn't give you the same precision of bone as an X-ray or even a CT scan would. But that is a decision for your medical professional. In some cases, patients that have a significant slippage, either a grade one bordering grade two or a genuine grade two, um, you can actually feel a step on their back. We call it a spon spondylolisthesis step sign. So as the spine has moved forward, this bone at the back of the spine protrudes. And you can actually, as you run your hand down, you can feel that it is further out than the rest of the spine. And that is, again, what we call a spondylolisthesis step sign. The good news for most spondylolisthesis patients is that they will present asymptomatically, meaning no back pain and no leg pain. However, if you present symptomatically, either with back pain or leg pain, there are many different treatment options at your disposal. The first always being a conservative route by doing exercise and understanding what movements create pain and what movements you should avoid, and what movements your spine could tolerate. However, if there is a progression of symptoms, particularly nerve symptoms that run down the legs, then you need to speak to a medical professional, and they have both a conservative option, which is injections into the spine, where they can reduce the inflammation and irritation around the nerve roots and give you some symptomatic relief, or even if there is a significant uh, progression of neural problems and you start to lose function in your feet, they can then discuss other options as um, uh, along the lines of surgical intervention. The good news is for most adult ismic spondylolisthesis, surgery is not required. I hope that has been a useful uh, breakdown of simplifying adult ismic spondylolisthesis. And until next time, keep your spine safe and keep strong.